Welcome to the Duke of Word podcast. Today we are talking to Mandy Graciano. Mandy is a hospitality expert and acclaimed business coach with over 20 years of experience in leadership roles. And to add to the mix, she's always funny and educational when she provides value, and you'll see that on the podcast today. She's got strong hotel knowledge and deep relationships in the conference, conventions, and meeting industry. She also gives public talks and speeches on relationship management, contract negotiation, vendor management, and creative strategy. She's also the author of a best-selling book, Sales Tales, The Hustle, Humor, and Lessons from a Life in Sales, where Mandy accounts in chronological order her colorful career in sales and the skills that she's gained and the lessons that she's learned over in her career. Today's episode will dive into her experience, what she's seeing right now in the marketplace, and also some humor and fun involved. Mandy, good morning from San Diego. How you doing? Hey, how are you? It's pretty rare where I talk to locals. It's really weird in my business career that I talk to everyone else except San Diego. So it's so good to have you on the show. Yeah. San Diego unites. It's a beautiful day today. It's sunny. For the, yeah. It's, let's not rub it in for, for our friends in other places. Oh, we can <laughs> but spread the sunshine. We'll spread the love. We'll spread the love. But Mandy, you mentioned to me something earlier that you also use one of the most high tech pieces of technology that I still to date use. And that is a piece of paper and a pen yes. as you've kept journals. So Hopefully there's no journal about our entry here, but you kept journal entries from your entire career, mm -hmm. which I find fascinating because you probably have a lot of nuggets in there, good insights, but also incredible stories. And I see that you've actually created a book about that. First, tell me, first of all, why journals and why journaling your entire career to begin with? You know, it, I never had an intention about the journals. It's just something my grandpa was a writer uh, and not by trade, but for hobby. My mom was a great writer. Everybody in my family, just we just loved to write for fun. My little sister and I used to write jingles when we were little kids. We would create cheers and rhymes. I think we did a cheer that was something like, others have tried, but they always seem to quit. Face it, challengers were too legit to quit or something like that. We always did something with song and cheer and all that stuff. And I just, I love to write. I've always been an observer of people and situations. And I have always been that person that has a little journal and I'm writing down the situation and part because I don't want to forget it because I feel like there's so many interesting things around us if we just pay a little bit of attention. But then when I realized I have 10 journals. Now I have 20 journals. Then I thought, well, I should probably keep these, right? Because they're interesting. And then over the years, as I would move, I'd flip through them from 2002, right after September 11th, like one of my first business trips, just different things like that. And I thought, I'll keep these. And then when I decided to write a book, I thought I was going to write a fiction book. Hmm. And my writing coach was like, yeah, you're totally burst in my bubble. <laughs> you're not a fiction writer. What else do you got? And I'm like, I don't know. I've got these 30 years of journals. And so I started translating some of those stories um, from the journals into just real business lessons. Mm. And she's like, this is better. This is funnier. I can really relate to this. And then that's really how an accidental business book, a funny business book was born. But uh, a little funny, quick story about the journals yeah. is in San Diego, we have fire season and yeah. it used to be like September to November. And now it's getting earlier and earlier. Yep. And my husband and I, we've been together 12 years. When we first got together, our very first fire season where we lived together, he's preparing the go bag, right? Everything you need in an emergency. Yeah. And then I brought my go bags out and he's, this is just four duffel bags and five boxes of journals. I'm like, that's literally all I want to <laughs> say. I just want to save my writing. He's like, there's no food. There's no money. There's no water. I'm like, all, that's all that's important to me. So that, yeah, I've had the journals. They're it's still key. Here. I'm literally looking at them. They need to be reorganized but yeah I'll you gotta put them in a safe and a lock i think it's really important to have the journals and i personally have my own like journals in my old library but not really reflecting on life so i think being able to take those lessons this is real valuable information because usually when i let's say I, I wrote a book and i'm writing two more but yeah. it's usually you're thinking what about this particular thing what is a story yeah. that's relevant i think here you've already done pretty much the heavy lifting like here is the situation here's how i felt here's what i'm seeing i know that we can dive into whichever way you want but i'm curious when you work with individuals or sales leaders or you're coaching sales teams you encourage them to have a daily general daily activity keeping that habit 
or is this just something that you personally do and you don't really encourage others to do? Yeah, I mean, it's just something I personally do. I always encourage people to write things down, mm -hmm. whether it's in a phone or in a journal or a calendar appointment or whatever. I, I think there is power in reflecting back and I don't, there's not power in regret. I love Daniel Pink, but I'm not a fan of the power of regret thing. Yeah. But I think there's power in reflection and yeah. not power in regret. So I think if you can chronicle that and look back at it and learn something, I think that's really valuable. When I do coach with when the sales leaders or executives, I do ask, how do you chronicle things? Do you write it down? Do you put notes in your phone? It doesn't have to be fancy. It can just be something, because especially with celebrating the wins. Mm -hmm. I think that we're also focused on these big, huge deals and these huge wins, right? But when you can look back at a week and be like, oh, I scored five new business phone calls. Oh, I guided a customer towards this direction that I know they needed to go, but maybe they were a little afraid. If you can celebrate those mini wins, and the only way what those mini wins are is if you chronicle them in some way. So I do think it's a good practice. I'm not, I don't tell everybody like get a journal. That's just my thing. But I do think chronicling it in some way is important. And keeping the log, and I want to dive into your personal story in, in transformation sales. So you mentioned something that you want to disarm the stigma of sales. And I know that And when you're in business, like that's like your bread and butter, like sales is part of life. It's breathing and like it's oxygen or laser oxygen selling is like the whole gamut. But you mentioned that when you understand and you cross this chasm that you can become a better and more successful human in general, in life. And I thought that was pretty transcendental. It's not just you'll do better at your job if you close more. You'll do better in your business if you're able to get more sales coming through. But can you talk to me a little bit more about your transformation? I'm pretty sure you've documented it in the last, like you said, 30 years of journaling. Talk me through the stages of transference of your mindset on that and what, what really pushed you over the edge and how you, what made you see the difference personally? Yeah, this is a huge important thing for me now that was not very important for a really long time. And I would say probably in the last five to six years is only being a better human versus being a better worker has risen to the surface for me. But you know what I have found is if you prioritize your life in ways that work for you, right? So for me now, it's my health, my husband, my puppy, my family, my friends, like those five things always come before work. They have to for me. And then when those five things are at play and they're number one, or actually they all five sit at number one, <laughs> then the work and the money and the business, it all goes into play because I'm more focused. I'm a better time manager. I'm just overall better human, right? So when you're giving back and you're doing good and you're really prioritizing things in that way, I'm, I have way more time to do better at work. And I belong to this club. It's an executive coaching club. My husband calls it a cult, but I used to belong to this club. Oh it's, called, it's called Build Your Life Resume. And it's put on by Jesse Itzler and a, and a slew of people. And their whole philosophy, I joined it because their philosophy is literally the way I've been living the last five or six years, but I finally am able to put a structure to it. Mm -hmm. And their whole philosophy is plan your life before you plan your meetings. Put everything on the calendar you want to do. Put the adventures on the calendar. Put yep. the trips with your mom and your sisters and your husband, put all that on the calendar first, and then you're going to fill it in with work stuff. It's something I work really hard at because I know this is hard for all of us. Working pays the bills and pays my mortgage and allows me to enjoy the weekends with my husband. And it's something I struggle with all the time of that balance. And I don't like the word work-life balance, but like that true. Oh yeah. Are you the same? Yeah. Yeah. What do you not like about work-life balance? The words work-life balance. I think I wrote about it and there's probably a podcast coming out about it. I'm not sure if I recorded it or not yet, but mm -hmm. it don't live. There's no such thing as work-life balance. That's either yeah. this versus that it's look for integration and intention. Are you intentional with the moments that you have like it, yeah. on the weekend? And this is actually, I challenged. So one of the teams, I challenged one of our project managers to, to be able to do this. And I, I challenge almost everyone that I come across and turn off zero notifications. Just yeah. don't ever have them on. And yeah. if you think that you need them, you're, you're wrong because you can also get sucked into, oh, this is the time that I'm hanging out, let's say with my son, or if you have a daughter, if you have your pet or your family member, are you really there? Or are you checking email, getting those pings, checking those? And I know your mind might not be there sometimes because we think that's normal, yeah. but also try to be intentional with where you live and integrate that. If I'm here, if I'm exercising, let's say you're at the gym, I'm exercising. 
If I'm at a meeting, I'm talking to you. If I'm on a mm-hmm. podcast, I'm not also sending a little Slack message over here and saying, oh, what was that, Mandy? Oh, yeah. Like, I'm giving oh. you my full attention here. And right? I've been on those. I don't, I'm sure you've interviewed the people where you're like, you're looking down. I can see what you're doing. But no, I, I understand. I'm in the same boat. Be where your feet are. I, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I, I think this is a constant struggle for all of us. I know I struggle with it, but I know when I'm being the best person I can in this world, Mm-hmm. I am focusing on those five things first and then work after that. And I'm really focused at work when those five things are in line. Yeah, this goes back to, I think one of our episodes with Seth Hurd and he talks about having a purpose. And I mentioned that this is the most important but overlooked piece. Let's talk about it as a business perspective. Mm-hmm. Having a purpose for your business is the most like overlooked thing because it's, who cares, right? Why do you need a purpose? There's a slew of things like attracting better talent, attracting better clients, closing better deals. There's a lot of things that we can dive to in in that part, but also we forget about us and what is your main purpose and work plays a part of that, though the end cannot become the means to the end. So we have to be very careful that the vehicle that we're driving to, let's say I want to go to Yosemite, like my purpose is to go to Yosemite, not to drive a vehicle to go to Yosemite. We got to make sure we don't forget that when we look at the quote unquote work-life balance or a holistic approach to your life. But Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned that you've attributed though, that I'm not sure I I misunderstood this, that through selling, this helped you transform your mindset around that. Was it through selling or was it through your career in sales or how how did selling become a catalyst? You know, my friend, and I think I talk about this in the beginning of the book, my first sales job I ever had, I lied that I was a salesperson because I was so embarrassed. (laughs) Because I was embarrassed to say I was a salesperson because there's so much stigma around the word sales. And I think I've, over time, learned that a good salesperson is an educator and a Mm -hmm. listener and a problem solver. And I really like being those things. Those are the core of who I am as a human. I like to fix stuff. And I love to listen to people's stories. And I love to learn about business. I think this is... the. I think it's evolved over time. I don't think I can sit here and be like, yeah, sales changed me in this way or this way. I just, I think it's evolved over time. And I think when I became a better listener early on in my career, I think I became a better person. Yep. When I learned that sales, really good salespeople, it's about relationships. I don't subscribe to the theory of people buy from people they like. I think people mm. buy from people they trust. Mm. And I think it takes a while to establish that trust. If we went on a first date, you're, I'm not going to ask you to marry me or vice versa on that first date. Now there are some first dates that go like that and those marriages last, that's fine. Yeah. But I don't think that's how most deals go down in business. And some short-term transactional that you aren't loyal customers that you won't have again, probably do, right? Widgets and things like that. But there's even an element of a long-term relationship that has to be established there. I think the learning about sales over the years has actually made me a better person and actually dipping into the key elements of sales, like listening, trust, building relationships. That's helped me be a better human over the years too. That's beautiful because it is. those are the key habits, but then from there, taking those and embodying them. And you mentioned mm-hmm. something earlier and we'll, we'll dive into the trust piece, but I was uh, on a team webinar yesterday and I asked like, well, what, how do you actually build trust digitally and online remote today, like mm-hmm. full-time remote? And I don't think that this is wrong, like the principle where this idea comes from, because it still stems to be true. There's just different mm-hmm. ways to approach it, that trust is built with time. The more time you spend with someone, the more affinity, the more that they're exposed to you, the more like, hey, you're, you're familiar. I like you. Like the simple, I don't know the, the science-based term from it, but yeah. it's just like being exposed and having that affinity. Like that's what brands do all the time, get in front of you and show you that same image over and over again. Yeah. But when it comes to building trust now today, we're doing that through a, a digital mean. We're doing yes. that through non-physical interactions. There might be physical inter- interactions, but most of it is digital through a through a video or through an image or through voice or through audio. And I think being able to build that trust over time, what you said was the most important piece is how do you really build and lock in that trust? And that's through listening to someone else's story mm-hmm. because their story is uniquely their own and mm-hmm. their story it's, it's them as a whole human and integrity. And when you accept that, it's like, this person sees who I am. So 
how have you seen teams with, if in your coaching or in your practice or in your support, how are you seeing the most effective teams be able to engage in that relationship and transform those stories into a better conversation that allows them to guide them through a sales process? Yeah, I think a couple of things. So even the, the notion that you had mentioned about building trust and trust takes time. I think taking that a little step further too is trust takes time and effort, right? Because you can have time in a relationship, but it's stagnant, right? Like you're doing your job, the other person's doing their job and you're just bouncing back and forth. But when you pepper in some effort on top of the time, Mm -hmm. that's where the magic happens exponentially in terms of trust. So that effort is, asking personal questions instead of how are you, what made you laugh today or what made you laugh this weekend? Hmm. Instead of how can I help you? A better question is what has changed for you in this past year or how have you changed? I think the people and the entities, the companies that take the time to retool these questions, these trust questions Hmm. are the ones that are getting to those deeper relationships. And that's something during COVID I, I learned and retrained myself on is like, During COVID, we all knew how we were doing, right? We were tired, we were stressed, we were fearful, we were uncertain. So I just took that boring, how are you question, I took it off the table. And then I encouraged everybody that I worked with. And then I did the same with my vendors and my customers and my conference business is take the boring questions off the table, just remove it and replace it. So if you're that person that says, how are you? Or how can I help you? What two questions can you replace that with? Just do that and do that today. You do, it doesn't even have to be COVID anymore. And by doing those two things, the, the answers that came about were awesome because then there were some common denominators. Like I just did this the other day where I was engaging with a supplier and I was like, hey, what made you laugh this weekend? And she said something about she's got a puppy and it's a doodle and this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, oh. I've got a doodle. You instantly have some sort of relationship with somebody just by asking one question. So I think in practice, the people that are asking better questions, more meaningful questions are the ones that are getting to that deeper level of trust. And then I think the people that are taking that trust a step further, and instead of just trust in time, trust in effort and time are the ones that are really doing well. Yeah, effort and being able to translate what are the common experiences? Because if from the vendor standpoint, they're going to be talking to hopefully five other people before the making a decision. So if you're saying the same questions that they're at, that others are asking, what makes you really different? It will part of the year value problem, of course. But do you have a list or and more inspiration? What are good trust building questions? I do. That? I'm obsessed with trust building questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, they're actually, they're on my website. Uh, they're on uh, sales tales nuggets. So you can actually, if you go to mandygraziano.com and there's a sales book tab, you click on sales nuggets. And I actually, I didn't create it. Um, Someone on my team created these beautiful little infographics. So you can actually download it, put it in your break room, save it, put it on your phone, whatever. Because I believe in these so much that I'm like, let's just share these with the world. So there's a whole bunch of questions and hacks that are on there too. Yeah. So yeah, they're everywhere. They're they're everywhere I am are the questions that I suggest you ask for to build more trust. Okay, cool. So we'll link out to that just to to make sure. But for the audience listening right now, like when they're building trust, what are some of the questions that you like to backdrop on or to lean on? So instead of how is the decision made, which is what's the decision timeline? How boring is that? I think a better question is what will impact the decision or Mm. what factors need to happen that hop the hurdle for the decision to be made. So Mm. just little things, because there's always a hurdle in the decision-making process and there's an impact. And instead of how are you, what made you laugh? How have you changed? How has your business changed? What keeps you up at night right now? I think what keeps you up at night in general is a thing, but like right now in this moment, what's keeping you up at night? It might not have anything to do with business. Yeah. It may be that somebody just had their third baby. They're now half in the office and they're half at home. And that experience is different. So yeah. you know, it's okay to get personal with people. I think now more than ever, go for those personal questions. How have you changed? What keeps you up at night right now? What, what makes you laugh today, this week? What's on tap for the weekend? 
nobody asks that anymore. <laughs> and it's, if you are engaging with somebody on a Thursday or a Friday, something's happening on the weekend and maybe it's nothing. Maybe they're going to sit and stare at a wall all weekend. That's fine too. Hey. But ask the question. If you, if you go into a meeting and you start the meeting, you're like, all right, everybody, let's get to it. Like, cool story, bro. But people <laughs> are much more intense now with how they want to engage. So like, just yeah. break the ice and Hey, what's on tap for everybody's weekend? Just give it a shot. You'll just, you'll disarm the tension in the room and it'll probably be a lot more productive meeting too. Yeah, I'm personally taking mental notes because I, it is Thursday at the time of this recording. I do have Ooh. appointments lined up after this. I will be asking what's on tap for the weekend. Let's, let's practice. What's on tap for the weekend for you? <laughs> I have zero idea. I have not looked beyond Friday. <laughs> All right, there you go. I'm preparing, right? No, so I think it's interesting because I'll give you like a real life example. I was part of, we were hiring a VP of sales and every single, you're hiring salespeople, right? So they know what questions to ask. But the end of every single interview, almost to a T, every single one of them, the same question was like, so what'd you think? Are we going to move forward? I'm like, I thought it was good. I'm like, they want next step. They want closure. They want to set the next appointment. I get it. They're following the playbook, but they all said almost the exact same iteration or an iteration of, of that exact same question. Yeah. And then now I'm like, there's probably better questions that they could have asked now, like thinking about this. So I think right now for our listeners, and we'll dive into, if you're not in sales, you're in sales, just plain that we'll talk about you're why that is. You're in sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's being able to look at the experience that you have. Let's say you run a coffee stand. Let's say you are doing console calls. Let's say you're selling enterprise software. Let's say you're selling your own software, whatever it might be, the slew of opportunities or a service is looking at what does the customer experience look like? And when they're coming to me, what are some of the questions that I know they already have in mind and how can I change the conversation in order to be not just entertaining for the entertaining sake, but also yeah. meaningful in a way to add value, but also make it a little different. Cause if this is their fifth consult with a vendor or a, they're not, they're, you're, they're not the first person that they're ever going to talk to or that they have right. talked to. So I think being able to think, like you mentioned, make it fun or make it enjoyable, elevate the, the experience, but also still work through the lines of business because the best conversations, in my opinion, when it comes to sales or even making a, having a meeting is feeling like you, there was zero effort. It feels like it was like a perfect flow. It felt like it was just having a simple yeah. conversation, even though we got a lot of things done. I think that's when you really know you're talking to a, a professional that practices and that it's a good experience. Yeah. Getting in the zone is a big deal and not getting in the zone because you're thinking about what question to ask next, but going back to what you said before, be in that moment, right? Be where your feet and really listen to what the, they're saying and then, and ask questions based on what they're saying, not based on what you practiced should be the next question. And I think that's a big thing business owners and salespeople do wrong is they'll go into a meeting ready or an interview, for example. I've, I've actually coached a lot of people going into a final interview or a next interview, and they're like, here's everything I wanna know. It's, that's awesome. But if the conversation takes a reroute, go with that reroute and ask the questions pertinent to whatever the, a person on the other end is saying. So I think going into a conversation with your five things you wanna ask, be prepared always, yeah. but also, have, be prepared for a half-baked situation that something might redirect. Be flexible, completely mm -hmm. flexible. And I sure. think that takes a lot of practice. I'm curious yeah. to know what you think. I, I wrote about this is level one, when you're selling level one, you're selling a product or service level two, you start selling transformations, but level mm. three, you're selling experiences. Mm. And I want to get your thought on that. I disagree with that. I think, okay. I don't know. I don't know if it's level one, two or three. I think you're always selling experiences and solutions, even if it's a widget. Uber isn't a taxi company. Uber is a technology company. Yeah. So I think I think you're always selling either a solution or you're selling an experience, even if you are selling a widget. I think you just, if you're selling the widget, you have to figure out what problem does this solve? What experience does this give? And sell that, offer mm -hmm. that to the customers. How does this widget change somebody's life? Or how does this service make somebody's life better? And I think if you can figure what that piece is, then you've really got the keys to the kingdom. Yeah, I think it's important. And I appreciate the pushback. And I love being able to have that discussion because yeah. I think it does go back to making sure that we're, we're emphasizing the experience and not just emphasizing the features or benefits or like the outcomes. Yeah. I think you mentioned it earlier. And I think it's important, like right now, people more than ever 
are desiring experiences. They're desiring not just, oh, I want to go buy an experience, go to an event or a concert or whatever. It's more about, I want my experience to be catered to me. Like we yeah. saw that with the great resignation. People are leaving their jobs because the experience isn't there. And mm -hmm. most of it is stress, overwork, overwhelm, mental health, definitely a big one. And a lot of that comes from just a poor experience from leadership, in my opinion, from if you look mm -hmm. at some of the research. So I think having an emphasis of what is it actually like working with you? How am I going to feel in, in this relationship that we build? I'm curious to know what are some of your personal trends or personal things that you're seeing happening right now in the market, either good or bad, that we can be improving or that the, the sales professionals are losing out on or doing really well at yeah, this time. I think there's some bad things that I'm, I'm confident could turn around, but what I'm mm. seeing a lot is businesses and salespeople are not fully staffed yet, understandably. And in tandem, the volume of business has quadrupled, if not more than that. Yeah. And we're going back to time management basics of proposals mm. are coming over with a ton of errors. So there's accuracy issues, there's response time delays, and there's just in general communication issues. So I, I really think business people right now have to go back to the basics when they figure out, okay, what is our volume of business right now? How many people, body solutions do we need to put in place to be able to handle the business? And then go from there. I think literally that's the baseline right now. And, and I'm seeing as a coach, but I'm also seeing it as a buyer and a client. And, and there's so many simple solutions, right? There's schedule out your time in buckets and answer emails during this parts of the day and turn off your notifications. Something so simple like that produces productivity in a way that's great. And I, I, I think we talked about this earlier. I posted the question on LinkedIn how are salespeople staying organized right now? Because I want to have that conversation. Mm. And then a couple people replied with the tactics they're doing, but I want to hear everything everybody's doing because I, I think we can share information with each other right now. I know that's mm. a frustration I have is when a salesperson is selling to me and they've given me a proposal and I've gotten proposals from like 50 vendors. And then I've shortlisted three, three products, three services. And then they come back to me and say, can you remind me what I offered again? I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, love. Do, do you not save can your you information? Help me sell? Like, like why? And, and the thing is, is, I don't mind reminding you, but number one, if I remind you what I, what you offered, you're lucky you're asking me because I'm pretty ethical and honest, Yeah. but there's a whole bunch of people that are going to be like, here's what you offered. <laughs> and it's not yeah. probably going to be what you offered. That's number one. But number two, when you're asking me, can you remind me what I offered? then I have to take 10 minutes out of my day to pull up your proposal, copy, paste, whatever, and send that to you. And in my mind, I want the relationship and experience with the salesperson. I, it should be frictionless, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Everything you should do should be with the intention to move the move. needle forward and everything. Yeah. And as soon as you stay unorganized, and as soon as you ask the person, can you remind me what I offered? You're putting it back on them and it's not a good thing. And so a lot of times my clients, they love a particular hotel. So my conference business, they love a particular hotel. And so I don't have the luxury of saying, you know what? No, we're going to go to somebody else who has their act together. Then I have to just really be on it with that particular hotel and really collaborate with them. And I think 2020 until earlier this year, I've been really empathetic yeah. and I've been extending so much grace because I know so many people were laid off. And so many people that came back from furlough were clunky and rusty, and that's totally understandable. But now it's time. Like it's time to tie the shoelaces a little tighter and button it up and figure out what your processes are because it's getting uglier than ever. And if, if vendors, if buyers or customers like me don't put my flag in the sand and say, okay, enough's enough. We've been cool with you. And now it's time to tighten it up. Then I think it's going to continue like this. So I've been, I would say over the last month, pretty adamant about get yourself organized, man, because uh, this isn't going to fly. I'll do this one time, but do not ask me for your proposal again. Yeah. And I, and I was going to say that I'm trying, I'm working to lead more empathetically, but yeah, for me, that would be an immediate no, but I understand mm -hmm. that you all, we all see it, understand where the person's coming from. I think that's also one of the key nuances with digital work is that it's so 
for most people or for some people, it's so new. And even for like me, who I believe I tend to be a more on the organized side, sometimes it can be a little bit of a, of an effort, a higher effort output just to stay on top of it when you're doing so much digitally remote at scale. So it's pretty interesting that the basics of blocking and tackling and evolving that the new age of work, it's nice that it's nothing new, but it's mm -hmm. just adapting to something new. And I think we'll see that transpire over time. Well, Mandy, for our listeners out there, what is the best place for people to one, thank you for being on today and two, learn a little bit more about what you're up to? Yeah, I love gratitude. So thank you for having me on. And you can go to mandygraziano.com. You can email me at coach at mandygraziano.com. I'm all over Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. You can find me on any of this. Look for Mandy Graziano, Mandy with an I, Graziano with a Z. Find me anywhere there. And then my audio book just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's a, a build on from my book the, that came out in October. Mm -hmm. So you can download the audio book. You can buy the book on Amazon. You can find me anywhere. Just Google me. Sales Tales of the book. We'll have a link in the show notes. And Mandy, thank you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. This has been super fun. Thanks so much for being here with us today. If you liked today's episode with Mandy, please consider sharing this with someone who you might believe could benefit from Mandy's message. And if you have any feedback for the podcast or recommendations on topics you want us to dive deep into or guests that you'd like us to have on the, on the show, just go ahead and send us an email at podcast at dogoodwork.io. That's podcast at dogoodwork.io. And as always, it is an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work. <laughs> <laughs>